I'm the Senior Vice President of Client Solutions, and I'm here to host the webinar today on how to leverage talent acquisition tech that drives business agility, recovery, and growth. So just a, a few housekeeping items before we get started. You'll find in the bottom right corner a Q&A. Um, please go in there and post your questions sooner rather than later so we make sure that we get to those. All of your lines are muted. And if, re uh, if requested, there will be a recording of this event. Um, follow, or this will, there will be a recording following this event. So um, just a few housekeeping. Again, if you don't know who Guidant Global is, I encourage you to go out and uh, Google us or uh, see us at www.guidantglobal.com. So we will get started and let me introduce you to our panelists from around the globe. So first is Simon Blockley, CEO of Guidant Global. Simon? Uh, thanks very much, Robin. Can you hear me? Just checking quickly. Yes. Good, lots of nodding, lovely. Um, so yeah, Simon Blockley, CEO of Guidant Global. I am um, I'm always flattered to be called an expert, so thank you, and flattered to be part of this panel. Uh, I've been in the recruitment space for around 20 years or so now, um, and actually I've seen more desire for using recruitment tech quickly and uh, more frequently in the last five or six months than I had in the previous decade. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing some of those experiences uh, uh, with all of you guys during today's session. Okay, thanks, Simon. Charlotte? Hi everyone, um, I'm Charlotte Horton. I'm the Head of Innovation for Impelum um, and I lead Origin, which is Impelum's innovation hub. Um, I've also been in, um, in staffing for about 13 years. Um, the initial part of my career was in operations and the last couple of years working actually in startups and a little bit of rec tech. Um, and I've been with the group now for two and a half years. Um, so we work really closely with customers to help solve problems and work with our um, brands and their network of innovation advocates and partners. Um, to pilot new tools, look at new opportunities for um, growth and, and where innovation can, can play a part. Great, thanks Charlotte. Oliver? Hi there, I'm um, Oliver Croft, the Managing Director of uh, Flexi. Um, for those of you who don't know, Flexi is um, an on-demand contingency labour platform uh, based in the UK and we use our technology to streamline the hiring of temporary labour for the blue collar space. Um, we are very tech centric and have been through a lot of pain um, in terms of development process to create the platform we've got. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing those experiences and, and how uh, we use tech within the recruitment space. Great, Steve. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Lewis, Global President of Robo Recruiter. We're a candidate data enrichment uh, business using automation, working with Guidant Global and uh, Impelum and the wider industry. Um, to make st uh, staffing, uh, uh, hiring, and uh, direct talent acquisition more human, which is a, a funny uh, mouthful when considering uh, automation is involved. Um, I've been in the digital transformation industry about 20 years, 10 years at TotalJobs.com, eight years at LinkedIn, uh, as I led uh, search staffing and RPO. I uh, was a non-exec director of this business, now come across to uh, run it from April last year. Really looking forward to getting you involved. Thanks, Steve. Richard? Hi, um, I'm Richard McLaren. I'm the CEO of Hinsyview. Um, I've been in the recruitment industry um, for about 13 years. Um, started my career at S3, um, also worked for Hayes, and set up a, a, my own recruitment agency um, kind of, what, seven years ago. And we had this kind of crazy idea. We just felt it was it was mad that in 2014, it was, it was at the time, um, we were sending black and white pieces of paper that were supposed to represent our candidates kind of skills and aptitude so we had this this idea for video and it's kind of um it's uh it's it's gone it's gone crazy where hints of you is a suite of um a suite of tools of video tools optimized for the recruitment sector um so we've we've got in excess of 350 um customers on our platform um we're crowdfunding at the moment so uh go, go to crowdcube um but um and yeah and uh, we've 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 been working with um, the Impelum Group for the last year um and yeah really excited to be on this um, on this panel. Big fan, Richard. I recorded uh, <laughs> using interview yesterday with a mom project. So <laughs> keep on cracking on. Amazing. It's wonderful. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> Good to hear. Absolutely. That interview will be uh, out in the web shortly. And of course, my fellow American, Rory. Hi, Rory Spaniard, Director of Enterprise Partnerships with TopTel. I come to the conversation today with uh, more than 20 years of uh, global workforce uh, solutions experience. 
For those of, that, of you that don't know, TopTel is the world's largest fully distributed company, um, meaning there's no offices and all of our employees do re work remotely. Um, we are an elite talent network comprised of the top 3% of developers, designers, project managers, product managers, and finance professionals in the world. Our talent resides in more than 100, 100 countries, and we're changing the way talent goes to work and the way global companies access the best talent to meet their needs. Uh, we recently released a remote readiness playbook and launched a consulting practice to help companies along their journey to remote re readiness. And we're proud strategic partners with Guiding Global, uh, providing their clients with the top global freelance talent. Great, thank you, Roy. What a great set of panelists we have today. Uh, many questions will be answered in the next uh, hour. So the first question is, what is the new normal? Uh, it's a, a an interesting concept right now. So how are your clients adapting to unprecedented levels of change? And I thought I'd start with Simon. Simon, what do you think? What's the new normal? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I mean, aside from a wildly overused phrase at the moment, <laughs> Um, the new normal is, I mean, essentially it's, it's, to me, it's, it's remote, it's virtual working. Um, and that's obvious connotations around office space and a move from shifting physical office space to like desk space to actual collaboration centers where people can meet and be creative and bounce off each other. Um, probably for me, more importantly, it's about, uh, a need to think differently about how we measure performance in a virtual world. Uh, it no longer can you sit at your desk for eight hours and say, I've done my job. It's now about output and it's about performance. And that is really, really relevant in the world of contingent labor because timesheets, time cards are really how people get paid most of the time. Um, and you can't see the people sitting at their desk. So, so how are you tracking the performance and the output? So uh, um, there's definitely a, a shift around uh, proper use of statement of works and scopes of services to define what it is you're buying um, and then tracking that through to completion. Um, the other thing that that's doing is for, for our employee base and our customers, you're seeing, or oh, I'm definitely seeing a, a real desire to find a better way, a more, more efficient way of doing their job. It's not about the hours you sit at your desk, it's about the output and you want to drive that output uh, to be more effective. Um, so for the first time ever, people, lots of people are really embracing the idea that tech could do some of the heavy lifting, which can drive that output and the results much, much better than they could if you just had more hours in the day. So that that's that's in a nutshell. There's loads I can say about that. But in a nutshell, that's what I think the new norm feels like to me. I love it. And it's always great when you hear your boss talk about productivity. Right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'm, I'm tracking how often you log on, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, uh, what do you, what do you think the new normal is? Other than the fact that I have to get used to uh, being in front of the video, which my kids are very adapt to, but not myself. <laughs> I couldn't agree more with what Simon just said. I mean, working remotely is the new normal. Uh, at TopTel, we've been evangelizing the remote-based workforce for more than ten for more than ten years at this point. Entering 2020, there was a lot of buzz around future of work and remote-based work. Many organizations looked at it more like a benefit rather than as a strategic way to get work done. And within the matter of weeks, organizations around the world were forced to adapt to working remotely. And I think we could all agree it's been wildly successful and the benefits have become abundantly apparent. Moving forward, I believe companies will purposely identify jobs and tasks which can be performed remotely and focus on hiring the best talent to fill those roles rather than settling in on finding the best talent within a defined geographical region. Yeah, really, really great points, Roy. Thank you. So Richard, what do you think about the new normal? How, how is it affecting your world at Hinterview? Yeah, so it's it's interesting actually. So um, I read a um, a Gartner survey. Um, they surveyed uh, a bunch of kind of CFOs and finance leaders this year. Um, it was it was during COVID actually, um, and they found that um, seventy four percent of them uh, will move at least five percent of their on site um, workforce to permanently remote positions post COVID, um, and nearly a quarter of them said they would move at least twenty percent of their on site employees to permanent remote positions. Um, and I don't know if you've heard in the in the press, but you know, there are people like um, Jess Staley of Barclays, he's been quoted as saying, you know, the big city office office may be a thing of the past. You know, Facebook are extending their work from home until the end of 2020. It is, you know, 
as a part of a long-term shift to more remote working. And Twitter, the same, you know, they're, they're giving their staff the option of working from home permanently. You know, through, through COVID, businesses have seen, I, I guess, that they can reduce their operational costs by moving, you know, a large percentage of staff to working remotely. And, you know, removing the need for expensive real estate without experiencing a, um, a drop in productivity. I mean, in fact, I think most people would, you know, would would um, would say the same. But, you know, productivity is actually shown to be improving. Um, and then you've got the kind of, you know, the employee work life balance. You know, that's massively improved. You know, I, personally, I, I was I was a bit kind of old school. The fact that I'm not spending two hours on a busy train um commuting daily has been huge for me i could spend time with my family i close my laptop at six o'clock and i'm you know I'm, I'm i'm with my kids and and actually um kate lister from um global workplace analytics said that 70 77 percent of the workforce said they want to continue to work from home when the pandemic when the pandemic is over so the appetite is there and if the appetite is there from the employers and the employees then for me businesses who are you know are reticent to that change they're just going to be left behind in the hunt for in the hunt for and the retention of the top talent. That's my view anyway. Yeah, Richard, that makes perfect sense. As someone who was um, office from Dallas, Texas in our home office for uh, 10 years, I can't imagine having to jump back in a car and, and go into an office. So all That's great points. Yeah. So Charlotte, um, as the, the woman on the panel, uh, what are your thoughts on the new normal? Yes, representing all the females today, Robin. Um, I know. I <laughs> I actually keep hearing people coining the term um, the better normal as well. So as much as I've heard the new normal, I've heard this kind of new term come in. Um, and I think it's been yeah, a huge kind of um, remote working experiment. Um, you know, it's been accelerated by COVID. People have really been forced to kind of push the button on that. Um, but actually, I think the phrase that really resonates with me most strongly is the shift from high touch to low touch. So businesses um, and people on an individual level have had to mitigate risk by kind of staying away, by going contactless more so than we were before. Um, we've had to think about how technology can replace some of the interactions we've had because it's too risky to do those face to face. Um, and I certainly don't think that's going to go anywhere soon. Um, and I think in the business world, you often hear people talk about being agile. Um, and actually, we've really all been forced to um, act with agility um, and with speed and know when to pivot um, to kind of make bold decisions more quickly than perhaps people are more co are comfortable um, than they would be normally doing. Um, and I was actually reading something really interesting this morning about a company um, that have just brought in distance detecting bracelets. They start flashing red when you're in too close proximity to someone else. Um, now, if you've ever been in London in a, in the rush hour, uh, certainly earlier this year, that's the last type of thing that you would have thought would have taken off. So I don't think you can underestimate just how big the shifts in behaviour um, are and are going to continue to be. I have a really interesting visual right now of everyone walking around with bracelets <laughs> to avoid each other. That's really great. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Charlotte. Steve, what do you think? What is your new normal? So it's a big plus one to Charlotte on the better normal. I think COVID's okay. been a forcing mechanism to really um, make bring change about in, in an accelerated format. So we all have got this demand to do more with less. And certainly when you're in talent acquisition and hiring, you've got a high level of applicants all trying to get through a small door. And they've got a really good experience of you because they're consumers as well. So you need to be compassionate about that journey. And we're seeing uh, our clients use automation to do the mundane heavy lifting so they can focus on the human aspects of the relational candidate focus part of the process. I was, uh, I saw, I read recently 400 people applied for two pub jobs. Now, you know, that's, and these are really well qualified people. There's been a big push as there's been lots of layoffs coming off of the, um, uh, of, of the furlough period um, and, and people will be prepared to have a virtual assistant conversation so like booking a table with open table to get to the front of the right queue as long as they know when they're, they're in the first class lounge and people are very much focused on them so things like qualification screening uh, or scheduling of interviewing can all be done uh, with, um, with with automation and that can then go through to the hiring team's uh, um, calendars and they can have that, 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 that conversation with the hidden gems that might be sitting there in applicant tracking systems, but you don't have the data currency to update it. So I'm seeing this as a forcing mechanism for good to move across to get the humans doing what they do best, which is the relational part of the, uh, the hiring experience. It's a really, really great point. Oliver? 
last but certainly not least, what is your uh, new normal at Plexi? Um, so the, due to the sector we, we tend to work in is blue collar, those jobs tend to be um, on site and remote working is not an option. Um, it, the new normal, it's, it's a bit early to tell from our side as well, because things like hospitality um, and even retail aren't back to what um, to what they're going to be. So we're still sort of very much finding our feet. Um, but as a few of the other panelists have uh, touched on, I think there's a, been a shift in the way that technology is seen within recruitment. Um, it's about bringing people together. Obviously, previously, technology and recruitment are a bit of a, bit of a dichotomy where um, it's being a people-based business, very reliant on relationships. Technology is often seen as a cold, hard uh, barrier to that. Um, but in order to um, emerge into the into the um, the new normal, as it were, within um, the barriers of saving cost and streamlining processes, I think um, it's going to people are going to have to embrace technology. Another factor that's quite an interesting one, which we're, we're coming up against, is is compliance. Um, and potentially, uh, you know, the traditional methods of right to work checks um, and, and suitability of candidates, but um, they may be moving towards a, a health check to say, when, when was your last COVID test or, um, you know, have you had these symptoms? Uh, and similarly, from a candidate's point of view, the candidates that we've throughout the whole process, we've provided candidates through to uh, uh, cleaners within hospitals, through to uh, you know frontline um, uh, hospitality workers that are dealing uh, and serving those that are uh, working in the healthcare sector. And there's a lot of nervousness about the um, the safety uh, at work. So I think some of the new normal around um, candidates being on site is around um, what measures are being taken in the workplace to ensure I'm secure uh, and reassure people when they're going to work um, to make sure that they take the relevant uh, PPE or they're provided with it. And potentially, are we going to move to a new world where uh, workplaces have a, like a food safety certificate, food safety standard, but within the within the COVID safety standard? Um, and I think that's something that um, technology can also uh, play a part in uh, to help reassure candidates as they do go into, into those workplaces. Definitely great points. Uh, using the buzzwords compliance and cost savings. I love it. So just a reminder to everyone, we do have a Q&A that's in your bottom right hand corner. Um, if you will send your questions over to the entire panel, we'll make sure that we get those answered. So moving on to question number two and Simon, we're going to put you on the spot for this one. Is there an increased appetite for new tech solutions and automation post COVID? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> yes. Done. Um, um, can I get away with saying yes? <laughs> <laughs> so, so from a recruitment services perspective, of course, the answer is is very much yes, and um, on a number of layers. But if we look at you know a macro perspective, you think about the recruitment and recruitment industry. It kind of ebbs and flows with the global economy and employment levels, and. Um, you go from being in a candidate short market to a to a job short market and then back again. And, and they, they are the challenges, the cycles that the recruitment industry constantly navigates. Um, I think in whatever market you're in, for me, candidate experience is absolutely key. Um, but, you know, recently we have been in that candidate rich market for quite a sorry, candidate short market for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So there's been a real focus from recruitment firms from employers about sourcing channels and, and EVP and how do you how do you how do you reach more brilliant candidates um, and where do we get them from how do we generate more people to apply um, and I, I, you know Steve already did it but I don't want to depress people with facts about the economy and where we are at the moment but I think it's probably fair to say we are moving towards a job rich uh, recruitment market rather than a candidate rich recruitment market and what that does is it makes recruiters and the, the talent, the things that recruitment professionals have to do, focus less on the sourcing channel and more on engagement, more on communication and more on selection. So it's, it's not, can I get more into the funnel? It's, have I got the right people? Are they all having a good experience? So you get positive word of mouth. It, you have got less jobs to offer, but you still need to everyone to have a positive experience. And how do I make sure out of these 20 brilliantly qualified applicants, I am getting the right one? And that's down to engagement, it's down to selection. So when we think about what I'm seeing and the, the increased appetite, things like contingent RPO, things like um, video engagement and assessment tools, like, like interview, um, things like automation of basic elements when you talk about candidate engagement that RoboRecruiter does, 
they really come to the fore and there's a real appetite to engage and use those things because that level of work is actually going to be higher than it's been for a very long time and people don't have the skills or be able to do that type of work in their recruitment functions so using tech to, to offset and uh, and and supplement the capabilities that those businesses have that's that's definitely happening and there's an appetite for it and it's an appetite that's happening you know i'm seeing businesses change more quickly than i've ever seen businesses change we work with a lot of long-standing employers and and tend to turn like oil tankers that's not the case at the moment people are really moving and moving with pace um if you add to that kind of hiring managers really waking up to the fact and these things have been out there for a long time but managers are really waking up to the fact that the person or the skill they're looking for doesn't have to be in the seat next to them anymore it could be anywhere it opens up a much broader deeper level of quality and skill to that hiring manager and so then you get to the freelance professional communities like your top towers which also offer engagement with that community on an ongoing basis as well as access to them doing that work somewhere else in the world you, you start thinking these managers are, are now brave enough to try and do that and to use those types of platforms when they've been around for a little while but they're just the behavior seems to be changing as a result of of covid and this embracing of remote working um the added benefit there is when you talk about remote working and a platform like TopTal, you, you come back to that thing about time at your desk versus outputs the, the quality measurement um and, and all good MSP providers have the ability to go from timesheets to, to outputs in terms of measurement for their contingent labor that they provide to a client. But, but so does the top town. So do these freelance communities where actually we need to be really clear what we're spending our money on. If the economy is taking a turn for the worse, if we're in a recession, we need to count every penny. Then when you bring talent into your organization, you need to know you're getting the output you want, not just the hours you bought. And so those as three kind of key things, I think are adding up to the fact that there is a massively increased appetite for new tech solutions post COVID. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, thank you, Simon. So question number three, how are recruiters and employers using automation specifically to support their recovery? Steve, we thought this would be a great question for you. What are, you, what are your thoughts on, on how recruiters and employers are using the automation? Thanks, Robin. Um, there's a, a number of different ways. When you look at who does what and you look at the time invested to get stuff done, you realise that there's got to be a better way. Uh, and when you look at the whole recruitment process uh, to, to boost and, and support recovery, you need to make sure the right people are doing the right things for you and that they're supported and augmented in the right way. If they're spending a ton of time trying to reactivate the hidden gems on their applicant tracking systems that have applied in the past, these silver medalists. And they're trying to get hold of them on the phone and they're trying to qualify them and say, are you available? Where are you located now? Have you got the skills that I need? It's almost online form filling. And it's, we're better than that now, right? That's, that's kind of the 1980s. Now, now what, we, what we're seeing is that the, the expectations around candidates uh, have changed as well, that consumer journey. So that, hey, if you haven't heard from us, thanks, but no thanks. That whole kind of being abandoned, ghosted, is just not good enough. So there's a certain expectation when candidates uh, engage with you, like an alliance, that you've got their career in, in your hands and compassionately with the brand values that you extol as part of your employer value proposition, you'll look after them through that process. So we're seeing recruiters and employers think about moving the humans away from the engagement and the communications and the binary pre-screening and the compliance and the scheduling of time to speak to people, that can all be handled with, with thoughtful automation. And not clever automation that falls over and gets confused because it's trying to interpret what it is, but automation that was quite basic, but robust and consistent and works at scale to handle that, those high volumes. And if they're not right, they're rooted to a talent community with their updated version of who they are, their data currency. We call it PALS, uh, position, availability, location, skill, salary. If you've got those updated, you can do something pretty meaningful as an employer or a recruiter. You can fast route the available now dynamically to those people that have got jobs off uh, at the back, given straight across. Those people are located in the right way 
uh, uh, for commuting and with the right skill set uh, that are need on demand now, they, they can be they can be brought through. And we're seeing some pretty powerful case studies coming through. There's one from Guide Global on our site for some um, acute fulfillment folk within a, an online retailer. Again, now because of COVID, they are our frontline people getting us the stuff we need delivered. Uh, there was a need uh, to hire 2,000 of those people in a short time frame. And through our collaboration, our recruitment tech, we brought over 6,000 through to assessment centers, all self-scheduled. If they can't make it, they, they don't drop out or no show. They change their next assessment slot all themselves. It's nice and simple. And um, guidance can add massive value to its clients by delivering that sort of outturn. And again, there's cost savings to be had from staffing businesses and direct employers. The whole piece around scheduling and compliance, we have a case study that £40,000 was saved internally, and that goes straight to the bottom line, P&L, during this time when we all need to do more with less. So yeah, recruiters are being, and, and, and employers are being much more thoughtful about assigning human capital to the right parts of the chain and having the tech do the heavy lifting, the mundane side, all enabled and gifted to the, uh, to the people to pick up the human uh, uh, side of it when they're needed. So what I hear you and Simon saying is that candidate experience is incredibly important and that tech is helping recruiters really drive that candidate experience to the the, the right activity. So that's that's really great um, to hear both from you, from you and Simon. So the next question, question number four, we're going to go over to Richard. So, do virtual and tech tools generally enhance or detract from candidate and hiring manager experience? Right, right, right along with what we were just talking about, Richard. What do you think? Exactly, exactly. Um, so I'm not, uh, listen, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that a video call is as good as a face to face meeting. You know, we've all done the Friday night Zoom drinks with friends. You know, is it the same as sitting across a table at a restaurant or, you know, or being in a beer garden with, you know, where you can both experience the surroundings and have a good day together? Of course it's not. Um, but it's not far off. Um, and, and because of that, I think I think that hiring managers and candidates will be less willing to meet face to face in the future, you know, post COVID, because there's now tools that can facilitate the you know virtual meeting, you know, just just well, you know, successfully. Um, and you know, so what what lockdown has done for interview as a business is, um, I mean, it's it's made us it's made it's made being on video normal. And it's made people more comfortable in front of camera. You know, we're less worried about being in a suit and a tie in front of a white background. You know, we're we're happy to wear hoodies. You know, our kids will walk in, the dogs will bark, and it's you know it's okay. Um, so you know, vi video is now it's now accepted as as the richest form of communication. Um, but it's about ensuring you have the tool that's fit for purpose and enhances the process rather than hinders it. You know, like a Ferrari and a Land Rover, are both cars. But which one would you choose to go off to go off roading in? Um, so you you know if you use virtual tools to hire, it's imperative to keep the levels of engagement up throughout the process. The key thing is is that you know in the new world, um, the candidate may not have the benefit of coming into the nice offices, the cool location, and experience the buzz of the office and absorb the culture. Um, it's you know so it's it's really that's that's really really important. I mean our uh, interview, um, our whole development team is remote and always has been. You know. CTO was a remote working evangelist way before lockdown. Um, he's got a team of 10 and he's, he's I mean, he's never met one of them face to face. Um, but, you know, for them, virtual tools were used throughout the process to ensure that, you know, there's a high level of that human to human engagement. Um, and he, he still, you know, and that's that's how he manages them as well. Um, during lockdown, we um, as a business, we increased our headcount by 10 percent um, and we didn't meet any of the candidates, you know, face to face. They were all hired remotely. And if I take, um, we hired a, a head of marketing. So if, if I take her as an example, um, the whole process. So first of all, she received a short video from our recruitment partner um, to sell her on the business and spark interest. Um, I mean, we've got a tool called Hintro and on average, you get a 300% better response rate <clears throat> when you send a personalized video versus a text-based message. 
Um, she also then received um, a video of, um, it was actually my business partner, Andy, talking in detail about the role, the opportunity, the projects, and why Hinterview is a great place to work. Um, I, I, I'm sure it is. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, the video job spec is, is, is huge. It's, it's huge to really increase that engagement. It, you know, um, Simon was talking about it earlier, you know, particularly for ca passive candidates. Um, because the thing is, she wasn't just taking the word of the recruiter. She was hearing it all from the horse's mouth. You know, the person she was actually going to go and work for. She got her completely bought into the role and really excited. Um, and then the next part of the process was that rather than the recruiter having a 10 minute phone call and just, you know, sending the CV across, he did a, uh, a video interview, hit, uh, you know, our, using our product, recorded four or five minutes of, the, of, that, of that meeting. Um, I mean, he, you know, he, he could have sent automated questions. Um, they tend to be a bit of a poor um, experience for the candidate. They often work better for some of the kind of high volume, low skilled um, hiring. Um, but, the, you know, the one-to-one the, the -one sort of, uh, you know, um, peer to peer uh, uh, question, it is, it, you know, it, it's, we find is a lot, a lot more effective. Um, and then, of course, Andy and I, um, we had the benefit of watching, a, you know, short interviews um, of the five shortlisted candidates. We selected three for a full uh, video-based first round interview, brought one back for a competency-based final interview. The whole process was done in four days, um, all done from the comfort of our, of our own homes. Um, so, you know, and, and that, and, you know, the key thing was the candidate was fully engaged right throughout the process. Um, so, you know, uh, but it's, it's really important to, to choose the right tech for you. You know, we've all been in situations where using tech can take longer than doing something manually, you know, and even ruin the, the end results, you know, and this, this often comes down to either using the wrong tech for your desired outcome or not knowing enough about how to use the tech properly. Um, so, you know, and to, to enhance the candidate and hiring manager experience, companies, you know, I think companies need to identify the right tech for their own needs. And they also need to be educated on how to optimize it. You know, tech needs to be used in such a way that reduces cost and time without sacrificing on quality of the overall experience, or, you know, or the end result, I guess. Um, and just to give you some stats, you know, a third of businesses make an immediate decision on whether to hire a candidate in 90 seconds, they reckon. Um, so, you know, pre-screening pre over video, you know, this, this, you know, maybe that can be done, um, you know, more efficiently. 80% of candidates would choose one role over the other because of um, the personal relationship built during the interview process. Again, you know, just lends itself to video. 60% of candidates abandon the recruitment process because of its length. You know, if you want to hire the best talent, you need to make sure the process is efficient, particularly if the candidate and the, the hiring manager are not even in the same city or even the same country. You know, so you've got to have that, um, you know, that efficiency. Um, and 77% of candidates want to use, um, they want to continue to work from home post COVID, you know, so you've got to have these tools. Um, so for me, the question isn't whether virtual tools detract or enhance from the experience. I, I personally think the social norms, you know, the better norm as Charlotte mentioned, um, you know, I think the social norms and the operational logistical structure of businesses post COVID They'll just dictate that they they'll they'll just be a fundamental necessity, you know. The the question is probably more like you know, are you are you set up to deal with the new norm? Yeah, really, really great points, Richard. Um, so my only problem with uh, virtual happy hours when I conduct it with my <laughs> colleagues over the UK is at ten thirty in the morning Texas time, and I don't know if I have a problem or if I'm just really fun. So um, I guess that's my new normal, right? Uh, but you bring up some really, really valid points. I actually personally just onboarded my uh, very first uh, hire all virtually, and I have not met her yet. And I have fallen in love, and she's been a great, great asset to our team. But it was a, it was a weird new normal for me, for sure. So, thanks for all your insight. It's very helpful. No problem. So, as we move on to question number five, Rory, this is this is for the American in the room. Um, <laughs> Do you anticipate increased demand for contingent workforces over the next 12 months and our workforces becoming more global post COVID? I'm hoping considering my job uh, that the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. I, I think I anticipate we're gonna see an increase in the util utilization of contingent workforce talent over the next 12 months. I mean, our industry is a leading indicator of economic booms and busts. And having lived and worked through 
the post 9-11 recession and the Great Recession, I've seen firsthand the contingent workforce industry bounce back faster than most other industries. And ultimately, it became stronger and more vital than it was entering either one of those recessions. I think the same is going to hold true with what we're currently experiencing now. And I firmly believe we will see a fundamental shift in the way companies hire contingent talent, as well as the way talent wants to go to work. I mean, Simon talked about the task-based um, task -based work and, and looking at companies looking at tasks being performed rather than looking at it on an hourly basis. I think we're going to continue to see that trend grow. Currently in the US, there's more than 40 million freelancers and 78 million freelancers across the world. This trend is, is growing and a recent Gallup poll suggested that by 2023, more than 52% of the US workforce will be participating in, in said gig economy. Which leads me to your next question around the global aspect. I, I certainly believe that workforces are becoming more global. Highly skilled talent can be found all over the world, including countries across Eastern Europe, South America, the Asia Pacific, Middle East, and, and Africa. Uh, this coupled with the recently recent successes we've seen with remote-based work leads me to believe we're going to see more organizations break down geographical barriers with a focus on simply finding the best talent for the job wherever they reside. Can we, uh, can we coin the term sourcing without borders? I think that's really the direction that the industry is starting to, starting to head. Um, <laughs> clearly You're going to get a t-shirt made, right? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, I'm not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> clearly, there are certain uh, knowledge-based role fu roles and functions that are better suited for remote-based work. And I think we're going to see more organizations purposely set out to uh, to find and identify the functions within their organizations that can be performed remotely. Um, we have seen significant demand recently for digital transformations um, the past few months. I mean, it's people have asked us, um, you know, have we seen a significant slowdown? And I think, you know, the, the organizations that we've been working with have already adopted a remote based strategy. So a lot of what we've been doing has been continuing on business as normal. We've seen an influx in, in organizations looking for on demand type of type of talent or remote remote type of talent as well. So we've seen, you know, our 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 businesses remain relatively um, relatively consistent and we're still seeing a little bit of an upward trend, which I think is phenomenal given um, given the state of affairs currently right now. But I really do think that we're going to see organizations adopting remote based hiring strategies across their development design and, and finance functions. Yeah, really great points, Rory. Um, and you, ladies and gentlemen, you heard, heard it here first. Rory has uh, <laughs> uh, coined a phrase and a t-shirt start. The royalty should be sent to uh, uh, Pennsylvania. So, so moving on, um, question number six. Uh, really would like to hear from you, Oliver, and then followed by Charlotte. What are some of the considerations companies should, be, should make when using on-demand tools and platforms to access flexible talent? Oliver, what do you think? Um, it's a good question. On-demand serving platforms have a great benefit for companies. Um, they often they often offer more transparency as technology does, um, a faster fulfillment process, and in many cases, better value. Um, but the, there are key differences um, with on-demand staffing platforms can, when compared with how a traditional agency um, uh, may work. So it's important to, to break those down and, and just some of those considerations um, I'll, I'll talk you through. So um, the first and foremost really is around, and I mentioned it before, around uh, compliance and how does the on-demand platform manage right to work checks um, specifically with on-site talent it may be different if you're using uh, overseas talent uh, in different jurisdictions but um, technology has got a bit of a reputation for sidelining compliance uh, in order to disrupt a sector so the classic example is uber um, uh, that states that their drivers are uh, self-employed contractors um, and you know other on-demand platforms that are challenging the employment status of their workforce, um, and so it's important that um, that those uh, those worker statuses are are checked when you're looking at an on-demand platform. We are Flex is part of the Impelum Group, so we've obviously got a big legal team to support us, 
Uh, but even we thought we had everything uh, nutted down at, um, when we were when we were acquired. But even we went through a process with the legal team to ensure that that we were adhering to the employment law that's laid down in the UK. And it's changing all the time. So it's uh, making sure that the, that that is um, that tick, that box is ticked. Um, the second thing, and I, we when we launched in 2015, we were quite naive and thought, well. If you post a job on a platform, the employer get um, the worker gets a notification on an app, and they'll book themselves into the job. Uh, they'll turn up, they'll submit their timesheet through the app, and everybody's happy. Um, but very quickly discovered that actually dealing with people um, and the nuances of everybody being very very different. Uh, trying to just have a vanilla um uh, transactional platform didn't work so we actually had to invest quite significantly in using tech to analyze the candidate more than just skills and experience and we developed around psychometric test we analyze all the data we get to look at um the factors outside of just um, the candidates skills and experience that may influence their reliability and their performance at work all the way down to the things like what's the weather going to be like on the day of the shift um, through to does that candidate prefer early morning shifts or do they tend to be late for early morning so the system should potentially um, only, only show them shifts that start from 11 onwards um, and those advantages are great for employers um, and it only really the analysis can be done at scale when you're using tech um, because uh, quite often recruitment is done by gut instinct, which, which obviously there is a place for. Um, but in terms of at scale hiring and spe specifically within within the temporary labour market, um, uh, having analysis using data can be really, really powerful. Um, the, the final part really for me um, is around understanding what happens when something goes wrong so um, in our sector again um, there are um, we have some there are always challenges with people at shifts whether that's um, uh, no shows or um, you know, performance related issues etc um, and it, it's important when looking at on-demand platform for for sourcing talent that there is an accountability there and a channel for um for interaction with support so that um there's a things can be quickly resolved and when you're dealing with people um especially within uh, frontline candidates that we provide um quite often if you don't have someone someone doesn't show up for work something's not going to be cleaned and then something may not even happen uh, i'm just thinking of an example with again with uh, hospital porters um, if the if an area isn't clean, operations can't happen, um, clinics can't take place. So you know it gets to the point it really is life and death. And so um, having a uh, having a clear strategy or channel for what happens when something goes wrong, technology is really good when everything goes right. But how if it, how are things implemented in order to make sure that when something happens, there is a, a chain of command that can take over and support through uh, the anomalies or, or issues that arise. Um, so, so really to summarize, there's some great benefits um, that, that on demand platforms can provide to, to companies um, and, and really fits well with that scale um, and that volume element of, um, of recruitment. I'm going to hand over to Charlotte because I'm sure she'll elaborate on, on, on that question as well from our side. Thanks, Oliver. Um, I'd probably take a slightly different text. Um, I think one of the key things um, for me is actually going right back to the beginning and understanding what it is um, you're trying to achieve um, by using an on-demand tool and platform um, and making sure you've got a really solid rationale for um, how you're going to then use it. Um, because on-demand, as Oliver's mentioned, has many benefits, but it isn't always a silver bullet. So managing the expectations of candidates that will be using the platform or the tool and you know, internal stakeholders or colleagues that will be using it is, is really critical. Um, and I think there's kind of three modes of operation that I see um, in businesses when they bring in tools and platforms. Um, so people are generally trying to bring something in to entirely replace a previous way of working and there's normally some sort of cost efficiency drive um, or they might be topping something up um, so it's you know not a last resort but it's a, in case the current process doesn't work it's the plan b um, and then organizations are augmenting enhancing um, what they're doing um, and i guess this is the um 
which certainly we're in Pelham and, and lots of our, our, our brands we work with kind of position themselves. How do we augment what we're doing with the right tools and platforms to give our candidates and our customers better experiences? Um, and experience has been mentioned a lot today, but I think it's really valid because in a world that is currently so challenging and so difficult, um, and we're about to continue, you know, experiencing um, tumultuous times for, for quite some time. Um, experience is everything. Um, there's that um, uh, famous Maya Angelou saying that you don't remember what someone says, but you remember how they make you feel. So when you then bring technology into play, it becomes really important. So how does the technology platform or the tool make the person using it feel? And I think um, those are some of the things that sometimes can get forgotten because people are kind of driving towards knowing they need to do something different, knowing they need to maybe take some cost out or getting excited because they're seeing something innovative and shiny and cool and you know tech focused, um, which is great, but actually getting really clear on those basic things um, can make a really big difference. Thank you, Charlotte. So what I hear you and Oliver saying is that we are in the business of people and <laughs> people have free will. <laughs> so vanilla doesn't work. Um, really, really great conversation there. So thank you very much. We're getting in some really great questions right now and I'd encourage you to go ahead and submit your questions. So we make sure that we get to them um, before the end of the call. So just go ahead and submit those in the Q and A to all the panelists. Um, but we'll go ahead and dive into some of the ones we've gotten so far. So the first one, um, I think Steve probably would be best directed to you and, and then maybe followed by Richard. Um, how can tech also support more diverse and inclusive hiring? Hot topic right now, diversity and inclusion. <laughs> what do you think, yeah. Steve? Well, I, I like to define this. So, so I see diversity as being invited to the party. Uh, inclusion is, uh, is being asked to dance. And, and belonging is dancing like nobody's watching. Right? Look at those aspects, and in terms of the, the feel nature of what Charlotte said, the my Angelou quote, you need to make sure that you've got more than your fair share of diverse talent at the top of the funnel. And that means going out there and being proactive and making sure that you understand that diverse teams are more, just, more efficient, more effective, happier, you need challenge mentality, you need introverts, extroverts, or, or the, the many uh, aspects of, of diversity, so, so important. Now, tech doesn't have unconscious bias if it's done in the right way, right? So if you're, if you're screening and you're using tech to say, are you eligible, yes or no, to work in this role, in this country at the moment? Yes or no, it's very binary. It's a qualification criteria. Um, are you happy to submit to a drugs test? Because you're gonna be, working for JCB, operating a lot of custard colored heavy machinery. You know, it's just a criteria that you need to acknowledge. So a tech done in the right way and thoughtful and served it, it compassionately, people understand that and they know that it's worth engaging with their virtual assistant in an automated way because the output will mean that they have the experience that they expect, which is a real person who knows a lot about them, much more candidate focused discussion. We, we found over 70% of people were prepared, prepared to be more open, honest, and transparent to a digital assistant, to an automated script, uh, rather than the awkwardness, perhaps, of a one-to-one. -one. If they have any unspent convictions, maybe they can't work in this particular role. So we're, we're working with uh, Carbon60, part of Impelum, a wonderful story for UK PLC, 10,000 new network engineers for City Fibre. Uh, opening up across the UK, these mega cities, just the PR release went out and 2,000 people applied. And that just sat there and it was like, what do we do with that? Well, actually, let's engage with them and get their power, get their position, availability, location, skill, salary, and then fast route them through to the right roles. And we'll do that at scale. And when you do things at scale, the law of numbers is that, that, um, that, that you can improve the diversity of it rather than actually making the subjective views uh, um, too early on in the process. So again, as there's no magic bullet to this. Uh, this is kind of a rolling uh, on demand to make sure that people are qualified, taken through to the right assessment centres, they schedule themselves in, no dropouts, all of that stuff can be done by the tech. Um, I, hopefully that gives you a bit of a swing as to what we've seen so far around that question. Yeah, really helpful. Richard, what do you think? 
Yeah, so um, I, can't, I guess a slightly different um, kind of take on it. Uh, it's a question that comes up all the time for us. Obviously, we've got a video platform, right? So, and, it, and it actually, it was a consideration, we, you know, when, when we first had the idea of the platform, you know, the consideration was, is video part of the problem or does it solve the problem, um, you know, with the lack of DNI in, uh, in an organization? Um, so we, we we went to meet the the DNI director of a, a big four law firm, um, and she she felt it was it was it was a, you know a potential solution. I don't know if you remember there was a there was a case um, I, or, or an experiment that the BBC did. I think it was Inside Out, and they basically sent the CVs of two candidates, Adam and Mohammed. Uh, they had identical skills and experience um, and they sent their profiles out to 100 job opportunities. Adam was offered 12 interviews. Mohammed was offered four. And um, so, I mean, in those in the 12 interviews that Adam got, there, there may have been some racist with conscious bias. You know, uh, listen, if you've got, you know, if, if, if that is a if you've got hiring managers with conscious bias, you've got bigger problems. Right. But um, but to give the benefit of the doubt, maybe it was unconscious bias that, you know, that Steve mentioned, which is still a huge problem in the UK. You know, an, an employer looks at the name of, on a CV and thinks this person probably doesn't have the communication skills I need for my role. I'm not going to interview them. Well, unlike a CV um, or even a photograph that perpetuates the bias, what a video does, it, it gives, you know, it, it gives it gives the candidate the opportunity. Give, it, it, it enables a candidate to show that they do have good communication skills. They are articulate and they can answer the questions that are pertinent to the role. So, as I said, it gives opportunity that a CV just doesn't. And that is, you know, that is a, a part of tech that you know that, that really can kind of, you know, really help with that um, with the di diversity and inclusive um, hiring. A really, really great point. What a great story, Richard. Um, thanks for sharing. So we're getting in a few more questions. Um, why don't we take this one? Um, with the ever increasing pace of tech changes, are identifying early adopters still key to your strategy? And how do you as a business find them? So early adopters, um, Steve, do you wanna talk a little bit about early adopters and, and business? I am not one. Very cool. <laughs> You, you, you are Robin. You, you absolutely oh. are. You, you get these. You get these pioneers. I'm in for everything, but it just doesn't always work out well for me. <laughs> Working out a treat today. You're doing a brilliant job. Thank you for moderating for us. Um, you get these pioneers that want to disrupt and change just for the sake of it, and then you get the forcing mechanism where you have to change and find uh, some 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 ways of working, and to find a partner that that believes that that change is the new constant and that. that they constantly have to be in beta. I think Amazon call it day one all the time, right? Constantly disrupting yourself is, is, is a gift. Find those partners that see uh, perhaps automation as just a new business as usual is, is key. We work with Costa Coffee, UK's favorite coffee house. Um, they used to ask at the end of their uh, process, uh, are you eligible to work? We put that right at the top, say 50% of all of the people that weren't eligible to work to go through the whole process. So it's just thinking and turning on its head and having a partner come to you with a, a problem statement and a challenge, a pain point that you can think collaboratively with to try and solve is just an absolute gift. So I'll share this across the, the panel if anyone else wants to have a swing, but I just, it, it is great to be sitting next to those uh, customers rather than opposite them when you can work like that. Yeah. And what did you say the, the favorite coffee houses in the UK? So by Coca-Cola, it's cost of coffee. I'm never going to do business with Starbucks again now, Robin, but I'll give you that. Say, what about Starbucks? <laughs> oh, all American, right? <laughs> uh, anyone else want to want to comment on um, early adapters? I'll, I'll I'll just add a little bit. Um, yeah. to, in terms of our you know our, our client portfolio, and we get to work with brilliant partners all around the world, both you know, traditional staffing and then into the some of the great guys on the on the on this. Uh, webinar today but when I think about our client relationships um, we have a client base that we love we love dearly and I should say that for all of them but they do fall into into a couple of, of camps as it comes to kind of innovation and wanting to be progressive and and at the absolute top end where we get really excited about what we can do together there's this wonderful term of co-creation where, where we're encouraged to bring an idea any idea to the table and then it's just 
let's just kick it around. Let's see whether it can, it's got any legs. Let's see what it could un, unpick. Um, and, and actually, you know, we, we do that with, with customers. We did it in a workshop with, with the Robo Recruiter team earlier on in the year. You know, we, we have, we did it with Hinterview. Uh, you have these traditional um, stable uh, service offerings that we use and we embrace and we love. But actually, when you start to unpick what that tech can do, it can do much more for you. And, and I, Richard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't suppose interviews were originally intended for the likes of Robin to be able to use as a kind of cold calling mechanism on a solution cell. Um, but, but, but once we've identified a potential customer and we're having dialogue in today's day and age, why not ping them a quick video of yourself and say, this is what I know about you, this is what I've heard, this is what we're all about, would you like to have a chat? And it's a really effective engagement tool. And that's not what it was intended for, but that kind of co-creation concept of, but this could do it and this is what we want it to do. Come on, let's work out how to do it. Um, it with Robo Recruiter, we talk about using it for POWs, for, for, for that heavy lifting of keeping candidates fresh and engaged and talking to them. But actually it's it's a it's a it's an automated process flow we can use and do use to collect data. And it speeds up how we implement and how we collect data from suppliers or from workers. So, so the, these are almost unintended consequences. But if you approach the conversation in the right way with an open mind where you do want to change the world and make it, forgive me, I've got a plug guidance here, but a better way, um, the art of the possible just, just comes to the fore. Just can't help yourself, Simon. We just I can't. You. I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, really, really, really valid points. And and yeah, I mean, we, we love sending Hintros. Um, it's a really great resource uh, that uh, Guidant has given us through his interview. So, um, okay, so another question that came in, how do you tackle customer or potential customer apprehension around implementing and integrating new technology solutions into their business? Um, I think of myself, I don't like change when it comes to technology, and I know that I'm not the only one out there. Richard, what do you think? Yeah, and I guess I guess it um, leads on from the last topic, right, the last question, you know, and, and I think when implementing new technology, um, well, first of all, you've got to establish what could go wrong. So, you know, often it's previous failed tech rollouts, you know, that, that often is a, is a key kind of component of apprehension. You know, product fit isn't right for the customer, pre-implementation process is disorganized, um, training, you know, not delivered effectively because the vendor and the customer aren't aligned with, you know, with their business goals. So, you know, and then that basically results in users not engaging um, and adoption drops off after the initial kind of, you know, sort of buzz, I guess. So for me, it's about, um, you've got to assess properly, you know, does it solve a base a, a major business need you know is it a complementary product to your current suite um does it streamline processes and, and is it easy to use I, mean, I think somebody spoke spoke about this earlier you know that like it, i think it was charlotte you know on on kind of in, you know enjoyment um is it easy to use because if if the users don't enjoy using it they were obviously for us is a massive problem because we've got the added the added kind of pressure of, of people don't want to be on camera or at least they didn't pre-covid um and then you know can you adjust targets you know how will you measure uh, return on investment um so so kind of combat all those things it's it's about that you know pre pre-implementation plan meticulously you know, speak to the trainers before beforehand to make sure they are aligned with the business objectives. You know, negotiate extra training if you need to. Um, and for me, and you know, and I'm, I, it's a key thing for for us is it's selling the dream to the users. You know, make sure they really understand the drivers behind it. You know, but also providing the you know the vendors with with information early so they can align and they can kind of react to you know, to any issues that, you know, early on, um, but also allocated enough resource, executive sponsor, top down is, is, you know, is again, for us has been, has been absolutely critical, um, you know, so involving executive sponsors, operations, your tech team to support, um, and then understanding who the super users are and making sure they're, you know, they're happy so that they kind of, you know, they, they, they really talk about and they champion the product. Um, but expect resistance. People don't like change, as you, as you mentioned, Robin. Um, selling the product internally is key, again, with those, with those champions. Um, 
you know, bring in the high performance on side, champion in success, um, and, you know, and, and I guess manage expectations. So for me, I guess key takeaways, um, so make it part of your culture, commit to training, plan properly before implementing, um, sell the dream to users, have maybe have competitions to drive usage um, and never stop dri um, driving adoption um, and treat every single step as, as critical to success. Um, the, you know, our client base that have, that have, have kind of utilized that process have, have had massive, massive success. And I've got a free, I've got a number of friends. I'm sure, I'm sure, um, I'm sure Steve and, and some of the other guys will, um, will be, you know, will, will back me up on this. You know, when, when customers utilize that, that process, um, and, and, st and stick by it and partner with you, um, the, the product is always a success. Thanks, Richard. I love a good competition. I love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'd win as well. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. Never won. <laughs> so if you could just put on the interview roadmap, how to make Robin 20 years younger and 10 pounds lighter uh, on the Stop camera, then um, I would be even a bigger fan. So um, <laughs> we have time for just a few more questions. If there's any um, additional questions, please, please, please submit them through the Q&A. We want to make sure that we get to all of them. So this next one that came in is what lessons did you learn about your current tech stack or roadmap when COVID enforced new ways of working? And is there anything you wish you would have done sooner? So, okay, all you tech guys out there, what do you wish you would have done sooner with COVID? Um, you know, Rory, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this or Oliver. That's an interesting question. I mean, I think we're 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 a talent first organization, so it's more along the lines of how how can we leverage our talent to be able to solve client problems on that. Um, I think we've been ahead of the curve when it comes to, you know, um, come ahead of the curve when it comes to proactively building out the supply ahead of the demand and anticipating what are the hotter um, type of type of trends that we're seeing in the market. And you know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, we were. We've been seeing quite a few organizations really adopt the digital transformation. They fast tracked a lot of those, um, a lot of those efforts, and that really put a, a good, um, really drove demand, really drove uh, demand within the organization. And we've seen some very um, risk averse companies, um, traditionally risk averse companies, come to us and, and ask us to be able to help them um, in capacities that they hadn't hadn't dreamed of before. Um, not really qualified to talk about the tech stack as um, I'm more on the service delivery side. Good deal. Uh, so, Joe, well. just jumping in there from yeah. um, from our side, one of the things that was quite um, uh, quite enlightening or um, was was quite positive around um, working in uh, working in tech and being a developer within um, within the recruitment space of, during the sort of COVID um, period is. Um, was the ability to to adapt quickly and amend technology that becomes fit for purpose in specific areas. So um, where we were, um, and much like the, much like the other guys in terms of uh, Robo Recruiter and being able to screen candidates in a certain way, uh, aligned very quickly um, to what the to what the client wants. From our side, we. Um, you know, with, with the the changes in terms of right to work checks moving from um, where the government uh, moved from a physical in per, in person uh, onboarding to uh, video onboarding, you know, as a tech platform, we're able to adapt very quickly and make those changes uh, in, a, in a fast pace. Um, and I think uh, having um, your back against the wall with the pandemic that suddenly erupted and, and needing to to onboard um, uh, cleaners for NHS Nightingale in London or one of the super super hospitals, um, being able to to um, to change and adapt by using tech faster um, than than perhaps an analog process would really put us in good stead um, during that that COVID period. So um, that's kind of where I think the enforced changes came into play with us. Yeah, and really Oliver, I can, if you if you'll allow me, I'll just um, enhance a couple of things you just said there. We, we saw two really acute use cases that came through the COVID driven. Um, one was uh, the uh, the disaster recovery, the business continuity piece. 
how do you get um, verified responses back to your staff in, in a very quick way that confirms whether they've got underlying health problems and to be polled on that, that they, they confirm that they shouldn't be turning up to open the branch uh, in financial services. This was, this was a, a high street bank. Uh, we sent out to a thousand people in half an hour and um, they, they, there was a higher degree of engagement because it was a dependency uh, for them to, to come back um, than, than, than they did when they phoned up the payroll and tried to get people on the phone and tell them. So that you can do that at scale. The second, the second thing we saw with COVID is the, the compliance piece in and around healthcare, the frontline doctors and nurses, filling that out at three in the morning when they finish their shift. Uh, the, the 26 pieces of compliance they need to be going on the active staff bank to be able to update that and do that in real time on their phone. Uh, so then they're eligible for their next roles. Uh, we had an immense over 80 percent response uh, for that. It was that come as the moment, come as the healthcare professional. So that overall, everyone's stepping forward uh, with 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 Medax Global, part of Impelum, and with uh, other staffing healthcare recruiters. We saw a big, big push on automation being used in the acute moment to get that type of response verified through as well. Great. And Robin, I'm going to jump in with a slightly more trivial point, but actually, I think one of the things very early on in lockdown that we certainly suffered with um, in, in the UK and in Pelham was almost like a little bit of technology fatigue. So we had too many tools, I think, for calling. So I'd quite often have Skype open, Teams open, Google Hangouts open, and have things coming in on on multiple channels. So actually, from a um, from a from a user perspective, that was quite overwhelming. And I think you can also have technology fatigue um, there can be too many products or tools that you're given and then it becomes confusing for people particularly if they're not you know um, tech savvy it's a new way of working for them so sometimes I do think in this space less is less is more such a valid point <laughs> from someone who goes in between WebEx and MS Teams and Skype and all of those um, although I did have a client call probably about a month ago and we had to go through three technologies before we finally got one to work on their system so <laughs> I guess there's a, there's good and bad to that, right? <laughs> so yeah, Rob, I Robin, if me. I yeah, sorry, ahead, if I may, yeah. just uh, I'll just add on on to the end of what Charlotte just said around tech fatigue, and we've we've clearly focused on doing the job and remote working, and and there's a there's a, I was having a wonderful conversation with a representative of the City of London uh, only a, a week or so ago, and they're they're trying to prepare themselves for what would London look like in a month or two months as it opens, and all these big firms not going to need any real estate anymore, and uh, well, you know, everything will be pedestrianized and it was just what, what does London feel like and look like? And we had a, a, a nice, nice conversation about it. But one of the one of the things that was points made to me was the CFOs all around the world at the moment going, don't need buildings anymore. Saved 10 million pounds on real estate. This is amazing. Uh, and and I would just little word to the wise on everyone on that. We Guidant is essentially a remote business. Our people are generally based on client sites or all around the world. And um, so we engage with our people remotely and always have all the time. Um, it's a real heavy lift effort to engage those people, motivate those people, build trust with those people and actually give them the the tools to look after their own well-being and, and their own mindset and mental health when they're working from home or in isolated environments. So so what you take away with the 10 million of real estate, be prepared to reinvest with a decent set of equipment at home for a home office, decent access to gym memberships, uh, platforms like Open Blend, where you can really have a conversation about people's well-being and, 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 and understand what they need from their employer in a way that traditionally you wouldn't necessarily need to have done. So, so I think it's a roundabout way of saying actually what I learned about text is it's really good. It's really good for a lockdown situation. We are able to work with our people, communicate with our people and look after our people. But I think a lot of other people are going through a, a, a real learning curve there. Um, and I imagine, you know, given the people on the panel, most of which don't have office infrastructure and are often already remote, know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's, a, it's just a, a, little, a little subplot there going on with remote working and the use of tech to help with those aspects of it. That's yeah, a really, really valid point. I was incredibly impressed with the entire Impelum group and especially Guidant Global and how quickly we all went remote. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but what I also just got from what you said, Simon, is that you're going to start paying for my gym membership. So that'll be on my, on my expense report next month. Um, I'm teasing, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Not going hey, to the gym, public, I'm walking. I'm it's walking a pub, right public <laughs> webinar, of course, Robin, no problem at all. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Okay, so let's let's finish with this last question um, and give people some some time back in their day. This has been a really fantastic discussion, um, but this is a really great question to end on, and that is, what do you think the next big technology trend will be in the HR recruitment space? So let's just kind of walk around. What what do you guys think the next trend will be? Anyone want to start? I can give you a a wish. I don't know if it's a reality, but um, uh, the the wish uh, in a single word, I would I would say um, integrity, use, effective use of of proper data around recruitment and HR, um, and it's it's a wish because I, I every every job is still an island, every candidate is a is a silo, every uh, transaction that happens in recruitment happens on its own. Um, but there's swathes and swathes of information behind each one of those things. And if there was a uh, an effective way, uh, and 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 don't you know, don't get me wrong, we're looking at this and we're looking at it in detail. But there's an effective way to to capture every transaction, every point, every output from a contingent worker on an assignment versus a statement of work, every element of attrition, every stumbling block in a hiring process, every piece of candidate sentiment or hiring manager satisfaction, um, you would end up with um, the most rich data and transactional data environment I could possibly imagine. And that takes you into this new world of work where where data and the value of data is is uh, is huge. Um, I, I heard a lovely story about Uber the other day. Everyone loves a, a story about Uber. I don't even know if it's true, to be perfectly honest. But U Uber <laughs> offer uh, effective, cost-effective fares because one of their biggest revenue lines is selling traffic data to cities. Because even if you're not having a ride, they know exactly how long it takes driver A to get from A to B. And they know that all over cities. So they can bring up San Francisco City Council, wherever it is, and say, just so you know, your time, your traffic light sequence is out a little bit on the main boulevard. Uh, if you just reduce the, the red stop from, you know, for two seconds, you'll, you'll increase the flow of traffic in that part of town. Um, and that that element of data where you track, because you think about it, it's not just about the ride, it's about the cars, it's about the riders. And that's all valuable. And in recruitment, it's exactly the same. It's not just about the placement. It's about the candidate, it's about the application, it's about the job, it's about the non-job, the cancelled job, um, it's about silver medalists, and all of those things have value. But you, you, it, it, in, in, if I had a wish, it would be that re recruiters could start thinking about how to harness that data and 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 bring it to end clients to help them make really objective, informed hiring decisions and HR strategies. A really, really great point, Simon. I love what our CEO Brian Zokowski always says that that data can be noise if not used appropriately. So it goes <laughs> right into that. Oh, and it doesn't. And I should say, data doesn't have an opinion. So you still need expertise to interpret <laughs> that data, and then play it back in a meaningful way. Uh, and so it's not just about effective tech. It is very much about expertise and and rich experience. I might have to tag that on a T-shirt too. Data does not have an opinion. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Steve, what about you? Any any thoughts about uh, a, a new technology trend before we close this great webinar? I think some noise cancelling, so you can't hear my son pogoing outside the door here. That's uh, he's actually doing some analog pogo work, which is making me very proud off the computer. Um, to, to Simon's point, it's. Um, when I was at LinkedIn, I understood that data was the new oil. If you can collect all the dots and then you can connect them meaningfully, you can do something with it. You can get real time insight. What I've learned from automation is that you can have real time actionable insight, then you can take that and route it in the right way. We've seen some fantastic examples that we'd love to build on where you can make data driven decisions that are informed based on the, the, the real time automation. So we get responses, 40% of all responses in the first 10 minutes. 80% of the first 24 hours. And when it's that quick, you can field steer, you can AB split test, you can do some stuff in the moment. So I'd love people to take that type of challenge to uh, their recruitment and try new stuff out and don't be scared to fail. Try it, try it out because it's a, it's a communication, it's an engagement and we use SMS, everyone's got it. It's the great leveler. Nobody leaves them unread for a long time. Uh, you you uh, you haven't got fatigue on SMS yet. Uh, everyone's trying to do cool, trendy stuff with conversational AI and that 
we just have SMS delivered, have the conversation, what you need. And then when you get the phone call from somebody at Guidant Global, they know all about you and all the stuff that you've put in to get to the front of the right queue is all paid off. So that robust, consistent piece, but my wish is that we just be a little bit more kind of intelligent risks taken with what we do, uh, with the data giving us assurance we're moving in the right direction. Really, really great. Anyone else before we uh, close out the webinar? I guess the only last thing I, I'd say is, um, and, and, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what the, um, you know, post COVID world would look like, you know, the conversations that Simon had, you know, will, will, will we have, you know, nobody coming into central London and sent, you know, in city centers to go to the office, will everyone be remote? Who knows? Right. You know, I mean, I mean, I think Thursday nights, maybe, you know, people will want, want to be in the city, but, um, but I think if remote... it's, it's it's Thursday night and I am in the city, so thank you. Yep. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Hopefully you'll have a beer in your hand any minute, <laughs> any minute now. Um, but if if remote does take off and it is the new norm, then you know remote is also isolated isolation, right? And and you know I, I think with to have an effective remote working culture, um, you have there has to be trust. You know you have to trust your employees. You've got to hire, you know, more effectively. You've, um, you've, but also you've, you know, you need to be able to track performance, uh, you, you know, utilizing data without them, the, the employees feeling that they have, they've lost your trust. Um, and I think that you know, tech that can, but also bring those people together, bring teams together through, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep banging the, the video drum, obviously, um, but you know, the tech that, that that brings all of those things together. I think will be the key to productive, happy, successful, you know, collaborative teams going forward. Um, and actually, just as I'm saying this, I've got some ideas for hints you. So we'll see. Mate, with, with your face. <laughs> what a great call. We've got ideas. Great, great dialogue on the uh, finishing everything up. Does anyone have any additional comments? Anything you'd like to say in the last few minutes? I think as the world of work has changed, there's been a new drive and a uh, new drive to focus in on the talent side experience. And I mean, I think as you look at, there's a lot of trends that are saying work is moving more towards the freelance piece. But I think that there's a lot of a lot of change that needs to happen, both at the legislative perspective, as well as um, benefits and insurance perspectives to enable um, people to be able to work in that capacity. Um, especially individuals that are try trying to qualify as independent contractors, oftentimes it's the first time they're trying to go down that compliance play, and they don't really know what they have to do to become to qualify as an independent contractor. So I think that there's some service offerings that can be made available um, to specific to geographies to be able to guide the talent through what do they need to do from a business structure to be able to um, to be able to get set up as a business. Their tax. What do they need to have from a tax perspective? How are they carrying their business insurances? Who are the providers that can provide them with that business insurance? And I think that there's a real focus in on how can we help guide people down this path if this is the trend that the uh, that, that the workforce is is going towards. So I think we're going to see you know some some service aspects of the industry pop up from that perspective, and I'm excited to see that. There's um, there's some legislative pieces that are going on here within the U.S. Um, Certainly, some are precluding um, the independent utilization of independent contractors. You look at AB5 and maybe even IR35, but there's also some underlying movement to try to develop a different types of type of tax code because you're either qualifying as a W2 or a 1099. So I think we're going to see something um, in the near term within the next few years, kind of bridge um, bridge that tax code in between. And I'm really excited to be see to see something along those lines push forward over the next few years. I think Roy, Roy just, just came up with, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, Robin, sorry. I was just going to say, I think he just came up with our new, uh, our next WebEx uh, topic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just, I was just going to say, Roy, you're, you're right in terms of helping and supporting um, the talent on that journey and the different, and, how, and what they need to do to register and be compliant. But uh, Oliver mentioned earlier in the call that there is a definite um, focus on the duty of care of the engagers of talent and I'm deliberately not saying employers, um, because you know people have always used co-employment as a as a protection. <laughs> uh, it's not my it's not my job. But actually, you talk about COVID, and you're going to invite someone into your office. It is your duty of care 
to have the distancing, to have face masks, to have hand sanitizer. Um, that is your job, your responsibility, whether you're the employer or not. And so there is a whole element of uh, support and training required for the people who are, are requesting work to be done, as well as for those who are looking to work in a different way. What a great way to end. Thank you so much, Simon. This has just been a fantastic discussion. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, what great minds brought together. I um, certainly would love to do this with you guys again. Uh, any closing notes from anyone? You know, I can't help myself other than to say thank you very I much to my, my lead. <laughs> thank you very much to my fellow panelists. Of course, Robin, you did a brilliant job, but um, yeah, particularly uh, Richard, Stephen, Rory, Oliver, Charlotte, thank you so much for, for getting involved and for sharing your valuable knowledge and insight with, with ourselves, this group, and, and actually with the whole world, because that's the beauty of tech. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you, guys. Thanks, thank, so. you. thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.